כולם. אוקיי. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and I can do it. Most high God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. I am that I am. The Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end. All there is, all there was, all there will be. The Almighty. Gracious Father, Creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof, Abba, Abba, Abba. Father, forgive us, for we have fallen short of your will and your glory. Shine your face upon us that we may be saved. No name is more worthy than you pray than yours. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love, wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Peace, joy, and purity, strength, courage, and healing, abundance, awareness, and expansion. Most of all, Father, we thank you for Christ the Redeemer, the one who went to the cross on Calvary, shared his blood for the remission of our sin and the salvation of our soul. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides with each and one of us each and every day. Now, Father, we ask that you move my ego, speak to me, speak through me. Let your word go forth tonight, penetrate our hearts, souls, and minds, that we may be edified and learn of you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask you to bless each and every household represented tonight, Father. Look over this nation. Bless us and keep us. Bring healing. Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All right. Our lesson tonight is Ransomed by Grace. We are found in... Um, 1 Peter 1 through 2nd chapter and the 3rd verse. Ransom by grace. The author writes, If we are wise, we will readily take our car to be service. So if anything is starting to go wrong, we can put it right. In the same way, we need to maintain ourselves frequently, seriously and thoroughly, who we really are. Unless we do that, the insidious messages we get from the world around us that is, that are who we are because of our parents, who our parents were, where we live, and how much we earn, in other words, your environment, will eat us like rust into a car. At the beginning of the letter to the scattered Christians, Peter doesn't address the people in terms of their ancestry their moral background, their social status, their wealth, or poverty. While those are all things that were part of their old identity, he's sketching out the new one. It's easy to forget our basic identity as Christians, and it is therefore important to be reminded of this on a regular basis. We are people who, by the grace of God, have been chosen for a particular person, purpose. All Christians live a strange double life. Peter addresses his audience this way because they have dual citizenship. They are simultaneously inhabitants of this or the actual country district where they were, Pontus, Galatia, or wherever, and the citizens of God's world, new world, which they will be shortly say is waiting to be unveiled. So Peter address them in the matter of being a dual citizen of this world and of God's kingdom. So let us read. I'll be reading from um, the complete Jewish Bible, starting at the first verse of 1 Peter, and we'll read to the second chapter and the third verse of 1 first, first Peter. And it starts, to God's chosen people, living as aliens in this world, in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, in the province of Asia, and of Bithynia, chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and set apart by the Spirit for obeying Yeshua the Messiah, and the sprinkling with his blood. Grace and shalom 
be yours in full measure. Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who in keeping with his great mercy has caused us through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that cannot de de decay, spoil, or fade, but kept safe for you in heaven. Meanwhile, through trusting, you are being protected by God's power for deliverance and ready, for, ready to be revealed at the last time. Rejoice in this. Even though for a little while you may have to experience grief in various trials, even gold is tested for genuineness by fire. The purpose of these trials is so that your trust, your trust genuineness, which is far more valuable than perishable gold, will be judged worthy of praise, glory, and honor at the revealing of Yeshua the Messiah. Without having seen him, you love him. Without seeing him now, but trusting in him, you continue to be full of joy that is glorious beyond words. And you are receiving what your trust is aiming at, namely your deliverance. The prophets who prophesied about this gift of deliverance that was meant for you pondered and inquired diligently about it. They were trying to find out the time, the circumstances to which the spirit of the Messiah in them was referring and predicting the Messiah's suffering and the glorious things to follow. It was revealed to them at their service when they spoke about these things was not for their own benefit, but for yours. And these same things have now been proclaimed to you by those who communicated the good news to you through the Rosh HaKadosh, Rosh HaKodesh, which is the Holy Spirit, for, sent from heaven, from angels looking, even angels long to look into these things. Therefore, get your minds ready for work. Keep yourselves under control. Fix your hopes fully on the gift, and you receive when you're sure the Messiah is revealed. As people who obey God, do not let yourselves be shaped by the evil desires you used to have when you were still ignorant. On the contrary, following the Holy One who called you, become holy yourselves in the entire way of your life. Since the Tanix says, the Tanix is the first five, is the Hebrew Bible from Genesis to Chronicles, including the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses. You are holy because I am holy. Also, if you are addressing as father the one who judges impartially according to each person's actions, you should live out your temporary stay on earth in fear. You should be aware that the ransom paid to free you from the worthless way of life which your fathers passed on to you did not consist of anything perishable like gold. On the contrary, it was a costly, bloody, sac costly, bloody, sacrificial death of the Messiah. As the lamb, without defect or spot, God knew him before the founding of the universe, but revealed him for his name's sake, for our sake. Even though, now, through him, you trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your trust and hope is in God. Now, you have been purified, now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love in your, for your brothers, love for each other deeply with all your heart. You may have been born, you have been born again, not from some seed that will decay, but from that one that cannot, through the living word of God that lasts forever. For all humanity is like grass, and all his glory is like a wildflower. Grass withers and flowers fall off, but the word of Adonai lasts forever. Moreover, this word is the good news which has been proclaimed to you. Therefore, rid yourself, chapter 2, therefore, rid yourself of all malice, of all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy and all the ways that are speaking against people. And when you be like newborn babies, 
thirsty for pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow up in the deliverance, for you have tasted that Adonai is good. Amen. You have tasted that Adonai is good. All right. So Peter continues with some of the same things that John was talking about, fellowshipping with one another and being on one accord and being in a good relationship with your father. But he addressed something in the, in the introduction differently. He called them aliens. He called them aliens. He recognized the dual citizenship that we hold as being believers in Christ and then being earthly inhabitants. Peter greeting covers the work done by the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Thus receiving according to the foreknowledge, those receiving were according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, through the sanctificational work of the Holy Spirit to be obedient to the blood that was sprinkled, the sprinkling of the blood by Jesus Christ. In other words, God made it, God set the plan, the Holy Spirit spoke about it, and then Jesus came and did the work on the cross. Peter was writing to Jewish and Gentile believers who were living in Gentile nations. And dysphoria means to be out of place, to be someplace where you are, to be in a country other than your own. You are an alien in that country. He spoke to them as aliens in that country, and then he also spoke to them being aliens because they were children of the kingdom. He reminded them who their fathers, he reminded them who their fathers and faith were. They were sovereignly, sovereignly chosen to be the light to the Gentile nations. He foreknew them, God foreknew them, <clears throat> and through his sovereignty, God don't need none of us. There's no other king that can tell God what to do. He sovereignty, using his sovereignty, chose those people to be where they were at that particular time for that particular purpose. You can find that in Deuteronomy 4 and 6, Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Now, belonging to the now belonging to the coming part of the family, the family of God, they were all to fulfill their divine, authorized, and pre-planned kingdom mission. We're all given a job. We've all been given a mission. And we are divinely authorized to do what we're supposed to do. Salvation is a big thing. It involves the entire Godhead with the specific election of the, the specific election good of creating obedient pilgrims on earth who share in Christ's sufferings as we advance the kingdom of God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit were all involved in creating us to be pilgrims here on earth so that we can be part of advancing the kingdom of God on earth. Peter prays that grace and peace is multiplied to them that they will take advantage of the spiritual resources that our Father has abundantly supplied so that his grace, that unmerited favor, can be greatly expanded on their, in their daily living. Not just their daily living, but our daily living. Now, as we move on, Peter gets to the praise for salvation. Looking at verse 3, the praise for salvation. Peter praises the God and the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who saved us because of his great mercy. Not because we were worthy. He called salvation new birth into living hope, which is a positive expectation about the future. When we have hope, when we have a new hope, that gives us an idea, that gives us a feeling that something better is coming. We know that we're going to get something better. We know that it is something better. That is the expectation about the future. At our natural birth, our first birth, it was born into dead hope. We were born to die. As surely as you're born, without hope, you will die. But through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we are reborn. And once we are reborn, we are born to live. 
You want to find that for yourself? Look in John, third chapter, first through the eighth verse. Now, going to verse number four, we have an inheritance as believers, which includes rewards for our faithfulness and our fidelity to the king and his kingdom. In other words, our loyalty has rewards. You go to a hotel, they give you points. You fly on certain airlines, they give you points. Our faithfulness, our fidelity to, our fidelity to the king and his kingdom has its reward, its inheritance. We talked about, when we were talking to him, when we were in the book of John, uh, the books of John, John talked about our rewards. When we go back a little further in Revelation, we know that we are working for toward our rewards in heaven. We're going to get a portion of what we're going to get here, but the most of our reward will be when we get to the other side. Now, the reward that we got in heaven is imperishable. It ain't going nowhere. You know, you ever made a hotel reservation? You plan on going someplace, airplane reservation, and when you get there, they look for you and they can't find you? Or you get to your plane, they overbook you and they try to hand you a voucher to travel on a different day or on a different flight when you have plans to be someplace at a certain time? Well, no such thing can happen with our Father because what he got is imperishable. It will be kept intact in heaven. Nobody can take that away. When we get to verse 5, not only is your inheritance and safekeeping, you are eternally secure. Now we know how we feel about being secure. We want to feel safe. We don't want nothing to mess with how we are. When we get up, we want to know that I can go from here to there, do whatever I need to do without having to worry about somebody bothering me. Well, we are being guided by God's power for the salvation that is to come. God's power is protecting us for the salvation that is to come. When we are truly born again, you can know that that's not going anywhere. Because we can hold, it's not going anywhere. Not because we can hold on to God, but because God holds on to us. He has an omnipotent, omnipotent grip on us. Find that in John 10. 27 through 29. And he ain't letting go. The song says, hold the God's in a changing hand. Well, the fact of the matter is God holding on us. His grace is sufficient. He's holding on us and he ain't letting go. He said he's married to the backslide. We can rejoice in this. Nothing should give us greater joy than, no joy than knowing that we are secure in Christ. In the book, of, when the, in the lesson in John, we talk about once you accept him as a believer, we become legally accepted in the heaven. Then it begins to be the gifts that we work, how we work to get our rewards, okay? We are secure even when we suffer grief in our various trials. We are going to suffer. We're going to have trials and tribulations without a doubt. Now, our ability to deal with the trials and cope with the present is tied to our understanding of the future and our own inheritance. If we can't connect the dots between our now, being the trials and the suffering, and the not yet, the eternal glory, grace won't be multiplied in our lives. In other words, we have to realize and recognize what we're going through right now is preparing us to go home. He mentioned gold, how gold is purified. There's what's called a smelting process. When mine is fine, gold is full of dross. Dross is impurities is around gold. But when you dig, dig, get down the gold to start to get to its purest form, it goes into temperatures in upwards of 1300 degrees. During this process, all the impurities are burned off, burned away, and you get to the purest gold possible. The higher the rating of the gold, the more of the smelting process that that gold has been through. In other words, everything has been burned away that needs to be thrown away. We go through the same thing. Each trial or suffering is purifying us for a higher level, and we can praise, and our praise ought to reflect the same. 
So that simple trial, well, I'm not going to call it a simple trial. Your trial is your trial. But everything that we've gone through, every step that we've gone through has been to build our faith and confidence in our Lord and Savior. Think about it as as a, 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 a exercise program. One day you can walk two blocks. The next day after you get in shape, you can walk three blocks. And then you get a little bit stronger, you can walk four blocks. It's the same thing with our faith. It's the same thing with our confidence in Christ. He'll take us through one trial to build us to the next trial, to get us to the next trial. And each time we're becoming a little bit stronger, our faith is getting a little bit stronger, and we're able to glorify him all the more because now we're able to connect the dots to our now and the not yet. We can connect the dots from our now to our not yet. As we get stronger, as we build our confidence, we build our trust in him. We know that we don't have to worry about anything because he got this. Our father is a divine goldsmith purifying us each and every step of the way so that we are pure, sanctified, and set aside when we get to our final destination. Now, how, how should we respond while going through trials and tribulations? Well, we need to love Christ, believe in him, and rejoice in him. We love Christ by seeking his glory. So, we need to make up our mind how to bring him glory and just do it. We know that Whatever situation you're facing, you're going to face it. Now, put on your big boy pants, your big girl pants, make up your mind that you're going to deal with that situation, and you just do it. Trusting and believing that God has got your best interest in hand and that Christ is going to take care of you. Trusting Christ is not a feeling. No, you don't wake up today and feel like trusting in Christ. It is a conscious decision. You make up your mind that I am going to trust and believe in my God. And when you trust and believe in your God, when you trust and believe in God, without a wavering mind, he can act on your behalf. Rejoicing in Christ means being thankful and praising him because we are receiving the goal of our faith. What is the goal of your faith? What are you trying to get to? What are you trying to reach? Salvation of our souls. This isn't about eternal salvation. The first readers already had this. They had the Lord. They already had it. It's about the rewards that we are waiting for. All right? Goes back to what we talked about a little earlier. Once we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord, once we believe that, we've already reached the legal requirements to go to heaven. But now, Going back to that rusty halo, woolly robe, and that skinny white cloud. The work that we do while we're here is going to determine what our status is and what our rewards are when we get to our final destination. All right? Verses 10 through 12. The prophets prophesied about the coming salvation. They searched and investigated these things. How many of you have ever had an inquiring mind that you just really wanted to know. The prophets wanted to know. They searched and they investigated. They didn't understand everything that the Spirit had revealed to them about the coming of Yeshua the Messiah. But they knew they weren't serving themselves. Let me say that again. They didn't know everything they needed to know. But they knew it wasn't about them. And they weren't serving themselves. Now Peter and the other apostles brought the good news that they, that they had anticipated, being the other prophets, the older prophets, that had been preached even to this day to us. We still continue to preach what the prophets past preached, that Jesus is coming back. They preached that he was coming. We are preaching his return. This is so incredible that even the angels want to catch, catch a glimpse of these things. 
They're watching the church to try to understand God's amazing grace. Now we know God created the angels, but they're watching us. They're watching us to understand God's amazing grace. So now, we get to a call to holy living and spiritual growth. A call to holy living and spiritual growth. Verses 13 through 16. Becoming a Christian or a believer is a call to action. A call to action. When we're being called to action, that means that we have to have our minds ready and get yourself set, your hope, on the grace that we receive at the revelation of Jesus Christ. A call to action. It's not a call to come in, sit down, and wait to be served. It is a action. Action means to provide. Action means to give. Action means to do. We are called to do something. Get your mind ready and set your hope on the grace that you'll receive at the revelation of, of Jesus Christ. What we know about the future determines how we function right now. Okay? What we know about the future determines how we function right now. When we're going into situations that are unknown, we go into that situation skeptical, without confidence, and a little fear. But when we have an idea what we're getting into, we can boldly go into that situation. We can address it without worrying about it because we already have an idea of what's going on. If we want to live our best lives, we need to make up our minds and focus on Yeshua HaMasih. He ain't going to do it for us. He's not going to do it for us. He has already told us what our future is. We know that we already, being believers, have interest in the heaven. Now, where do you go when you get to heaven? We know that the wages of sin are death. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Now, once we receive the gift of God through the work and the rewards that we receive, where do we go in heaven? What action does Peter call for them to take? Well, when we become reborn, when we are born again, when we get a new life, that means we got to let go of some stuff that we had. Some of the old feelings that we had, we got to let them go to make room for the new. You don't move into a brand new house and take a whole bunch of old stuff with you that just don't fit into that house. <laughs> when you move from... When you move from the projects to the suburbs, you don't take a project mentality to the suburbs with you. You have to change your mindset because you're now in a different environment. Same thing goes for us when we become believers, when we become children of God. We got to let go of our project mentalities and start acting like kingdom kids. Our father is a king. How many princes do you know that walk around like they ain't got no sense? They may be arrogant. They may be self-centered to a point, but they know one thing. That is my father. My father is the ruler of this land, and I can do whatever I want to do as long as my father says okay. And if I get in trouble, I'm going to go to my father and say, Father, forgive me. I, I, I messed up. And most fathers will look at their child. You're going to discipline them. Son, don't do that again. You knucklehead, you embarrass me. I'm going to punish you for a minute. But we're going to get over that, but you steal my son. So, we ought to be holy in all our conduct. Why? The Most High said it. <laughs> I am holy. He made it clear. I am holy. If you don't believe me, look in Leviticus 11, 44, and 45. He'll tell you right there, I am holy. And if he's holy, that means he's separate, he's set apart. He's distinct from all his creation, unstained by sin. He's the standard for righteousness. 
Holiness is the central, is central to who God is. Nowhere in the Bible can you find the words where the angels will say, love, 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 sovereign, sovereign, sovereign. The angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. Lord God Almighty. Lord God Almighty. Amen. Isaiah 6 and 3, Revelation 4 and 8. This means his love is a holy love. This means his sovereignty is a holy sovereignty. God's perfect holiness is at the heart of his attributes. God is in a class all by <clears throat> himself. He is God all by himself. All the other gods he creates are beneath him. He is God all by himself. We are to pursue holiness by doing our best to please him in every aspect of our lives. Verse 17, those who come to God through Yeshua call him Father. And we are to conduct ourselves, we are to conduct ourselves in reverence for God by taking him seriously. He expects kingdom kids to look like him. All of us who are parents, have expectations of our children. We don't want our kids out in public acting silly. We don't want to have to go to the school because they're up there embarrassing us because it's a reflection on us. We are kingdom kids. Our divine DNA are to show up. You are to know that you are a peculiar person. The world ought to know that you are peculiar. If they treat you like they treat everybody else, then you're not being peculiar. But if they side eye you, they talk about you and treat you differently, then there's something different about you. Your kingdom kidness, your relationship with your father is showing up. Non-believers, they ought to just see you and just be like, yeah, there's something about them. And some of y'all know what I'm talking about. People look at you and don't like you just because you're there. You haven't said a word to them. They just look at you and can't stand you. Verses 18 through 21. Peter urges believers to live in holiness and fear because the Lord has redeemed us. Redeeming is paying for someone's freedom. In the book of Leviticus, Chapter 25, 47 through 39, 47 through 49, redemption is illustrated. Israel is redeemed from slavery in Egypt. Deuteronomy 24 and 18. It was called their redeemer. Isaiah 41, 14, 44 and 6, 47 and 4. What was the price paid to free us from sin? How much did it cost? How, 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 what, what? What was the price that was paid? Well, it wasn't silver or gold. It was something way more valuable than that. It was the precious blood of Christ. Why? Well, if we all doing the same thing, if all of us are in the same miserable state. How can you redeem me from what we do? You right beside me. Sinners cannot redeem sinners. If we both in a ditch, how am I going to get you out of the ditch if you're in the deepest part of the ditch that I'm in? I can't redeem you. According to the sacrificial system of Israel, to atone for sin, an unblemished and spotless lamb had to be used. Well, we know that there were no people walking around at that particular time that were spotless and unblemished. Christ, the Lamb of God, was the ultimate sacrifice. After him, there was no, no longer a need for sacrifice. The Lamb of God paid the price for all. Blood shed is a loss of life. The blood is in the life. Deuteronomy 12 and 23. 
the Most High divine, the Most High demanded a price for sin. Only He could meet the demand. So He separated Himself, sacrificed Himself to satisfy Himself through His only begotten Son to redeem us from the slavery of sin. When you have been redeemed, you no longer belong to you. You have a new allegiance. This was God's plan before the foundation of the world. He knew that the angels were going to rebel. He knew that the Tower of Babel was going to fall. He knew that he was going to have to flood the earth at the beginning of time. God redeemed, sin redeemed sinners through Christ and raised him from the dead and gave him glory. We have been transferred from slavery to the glorious kingdom of Christ. So our faith and our hope are in God. He will keep us. He will keep his word and deliver and reward his people. God is not a man that he can lie. God don't lie. If he said it, it becomes law. Once he makes a declaration, it is what it is. Sincere brotherly love is Peter's aim for Christian brothers and sisters. How can those who were slaves to sin be holy? Fear the Lord and love others. The answer, my friend, is by being born again. When you believe in Christ, you receive the seed, the divine nature that is imperishable. We can't lose it. God sparked life in us where there was once death. He did it through the living and endurance of his word. Isaiah said it, and we read it in the scripture. Grass withers and dies. But the word of God endures forever. Isaiah 40, 6 through 8. Now, moving on to chapter 2. Even though we can't lose our new life, it still needs to grow. Sinful self-centeredness centeredness will continue if we let it. We, but we have to nourish our spiritual life. How do we do that? How do we reach maturity? There's an Indian proverb I once heard where a grandson asks his grandfather, grandfather's explaining to his grandson, there's two wolves that live within us, one that's evil and one that's good. And the grandson asks his grandfather, which one becomes stronger? Which one rules? The grandfather said, the one that is faithful. Mm -hmm. Now, let's bring that to us. What spirit is going to rule, which spirit is going to grow with us, within us? The one that is faith. The one that is faith. If we want a healthy body, we need to do things that are healthy. The same applies to our spirit. The same applies to our spirit. We have to rid ourselves of all, all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. These things belong to what we used to be. Part of our old sin nature, part of our old life that leads to death. Separation from a fellowship with God. Going back to being born again, going back to being born again, new life. Peter is driving home the point that to be like newborn infants and desire pure milk of the word so they can grow for salvation. The same word that caused us to be born again is the same word that brings, that brings growth and maturity. Now the problem is, too many of us suffer from malnutrition. How are we malnutrition? We're taking everything in that we don't need to take in. Instead of taking in the word of God, we're taking in the word of somebody else. Instead of reading for ourselves, reading the word of God, we're reading something else. We're taking in things that don't pertain to what we need to grow and become who God has us to be. Now, the thing about a baby is you don't have to tell you the baby, you don't have to tell a baby when it's hungry. A baby will let you know it's hungry. It will not stop crying until you feed it. But Christians, believers, on the other hand, we get a little bit, we think we got it all. We need to be reminded that we are spiritually hungry and that we have to. Be fed. You don't see babies trying to eat once a week. 
They eat every day as they should. But what do we do as Christians? Oh, let me get up and go to church Sunday morning. We try to get all we can on Sunday morning to last us a whole week. Or we fill up on junk food during the week. It may taste good. It may give us a good feeling. But it ain't going to help you grow. There's nothing nutritional about it. I love Twinkies. Apple pies, cupcakes, chocolate bars, all that stuff. But guess what it does for my health? Drives up my cholesterol, drives up my triglycerides, and it's not healthy for me. But it tastes good. It gives me a quick burst of energy, but it's not going to sustain me. When I get some green vegetables, some salads, some collard greens, some turnip greens, some mustard, some spinach. I eat that. It sustains me because it has protein. It has calcium. It has potassium. All those things that sugar don't have. So when we go get us a tablespoon of sugar, when we pick up that magazine that says, oh, yeah, do this and God will love you, but it doesn't give you anything to go by, instead of looking at the world where there is real nutritional value, yeah, it just don't help you. A steady diet of God's word and not man's opinion is what we need. And as Peter said, when we taste and see that God is good, nothing else really matters. Nothing else really matters. All right. That was a rather lengthy, uh, lengthy discussion point. So now, what are some ways people try to define themselves or find their identity? What do we do to find out who we are? What do we do to say, this is who I am? Look, world, this is me. What do we do? How do we try to define that? Well, we have our jobs, we have our hobbies, um, education, titles, our relationships. Those are just some ways that we try to identify who we are. If you think about it, we are all somebody's child. We're somebody's son. We're somebody's daughter. Some of us are somebody's mother, somebody's father. At one point or another, we all had a job doing something one way or another. We all have went to school, so we have a high school education, a college education, an elementary school education. If you have a job, you have a title whether it be specialist in the Army, command sergeant major of the Army, um, coordinator, teacher, whatever that is, we have that title. And then we have our relationships. I am this, I am that. This is my best friend. This is my best bud. Those relationships is how we identify who we are. Now, Read 1 Peter 1 through 9. What are some of the various ways Peter says believers have a special identity with God in Christ? What are some of the various ways Peter says believers have special identity in Christ? You know, in Christ we have special identities. Not just an identity, special. To, chosen, to God's chosen people living among the aliens of dysphoria in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, the province of Asia, and Bithynia. Chosen according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, who set apart the Spirit for obeying Yeshua the Messiah and for the sprinkling of his blood. Grace and shalom be yours in full measure. 
Praise be God, Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who in keeping with great mercy has caused us through the resurrection of Yeshua the Messiah from the dead to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that cannot decay, spoil, or fade, kept safe for you in heaven. Meanwhile, through trusting, you are being protected by God's power for deliverance, ready to be revealed at the last time. Rejoice in this, even though for a little while you may experience grief and various trials. Even gold is tested for genuineness by fire. The purpose of these trials is so that your trust genuineness, which is far more valuable than perishable gold, will be judged worthy of praise. Glory and honor at the revealing of Yeshua the Messiah. Without having seen him, you love him. Without seeing him now, but trusting in him, you continue to be full of joy that his glory is beyond words. And you are receiving what your trust is aiming at, namely your, de your deliverance. What are some things that Peter pointed out there that are very essential for us to be able to identify how special we are in Christ? That we have a special identity in Christ. said we have deliverance, but we have joy and trials also, God's protection and love. What was the first thing he said we are? The very first thing he said to God's chosen people. It's the very first thing he said. We've been chosen. Once we've been chosen, hang all those things fall right in line. Amen. Thank you. Now, think through this. Think, what, what, what does this mean? What can be the effects in our lives of embracing or failing to embrace the truth about who we are? How is our understanding of being chosen, having deliverance, where we are, how does that affect the truth about who we are? Embracing them or failing to embrace them? How does that affect who we truly are? Think about it. We know that we have been chosen. We know that we have deliverance. We know that we have been sprinkled with his blood. We have been given grace and peace. We know that God is keeping our reward in heaven. We know these things. We know this. It has been written. So how, 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 what, what, what could be the effects on how embracing this or failing to embrace these truths can affect your life? Well, we talked about the known and the unknown, unknown a little earlier. When we know something, we know how to approach it. But when we go into a situation completely blind, we have no idea what we should be doing. But we have an idea. We know that we are chosen, because not everybody can answer the call. Many are called, but few are chosen. Once we have been chosen, now we are able to walk the walk. He take us through steps to build our faith, make us stronger, to help us grow. How can that affect the way you live? Make, think about your outcome. How many of you thinking right now, if your mother and father were the king and queen or wherever it is you're from, how would you carry yourself? How would you behave? Now think about your heavenly father, who is the king, the creator of heaven and earth, and the fullness thereof. How should that help you embrace life right now? Me? I'll be happy to work toward my reward. 
happy because I know I'm not guessing, there's no doubt, I'm not wishing, I'm not hoping. I know that what God has for me set aside in heaven, all I got to do is be faithful and maintain my fidelity and I will receive my reward. And then on the other hand, since I know that's already there, I can refuse to be faithful, I can refuse to maintain fidelity, and I can be miserable and lose it. Give it up. I can go to heaven sitting on the outskirts somewhere because I am a believer. Now, Peter says in verse 6 and 7, suffering and trials benefit our faith. How does or doesn't this make sense to you? Okay? Suffering and trial benefit our faith. How does it or how doesn't this make sense to you? Why does it make sense? Why does it make sense? Or why don't it make sense to you? Building faith, confidence, and strength makes sense to me. Building faith, confidence, and strength makes sense to me. It makes sense to me because I know that I know. And since I know, that means I'm able to do whatever it is I can do. And if I'm not ready to do what I want to do, at the time I try to do it, I know that my faith will be built. I will become strong and I will be able to walk that extra step eventually. Maybe not today. It may take tomorrow. It may take five days. It may take ten years. But I will get to where I need to go. Because of the faith and the strength and the confidence that's being built in me through whatever it is that I'm going through. All right? What does Peter say about what does Peter say about Christmas reason for joy? Why should we have joy? Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Why should we have joy? Through our trials and tribulations, why should we have joy? We just talked about it. It helps us to move forward. It builds us. It gives us strength. It gives us the mental strength, the mental capacity. It builds our confidence in our Father to know that we are His children. And then we can start behaving and reflecting that divine DNA. All right? Okay, through the Messiah's sacrificial death on the one hand and the indwellers of God's spirit on the other hand, God has set people apart to be living signals of, to, of a new world. They are therefore to be holy, both in the technical sense that God has set them apart for this purpose and the practical sense that their actual lives have been transformed. We have become new people, a thing that Peter will be shortly explore quite a bit further. A new life has come to birth within us because new life has come to birth in the world in the resurrection from the dead of Jesus the, the Messiah. Becoming a Christian means that God did for Jesus at Easter. Becoming a Christian means that what, that what God did for Jesus at Easter, he does for you in a very very death of your being, in the very death of your being. In other words, when we accepted him, we were born again. We put off the old man, we rose again. All right? We have a renewed spirit on the inside of us. So now, let's move down to Peter 10 through 21. What is the role of the te Old Testament prophets regarding the coming of the Messiah? What was the role of the prophets regarding the coming of the Messiah? What did they do? What did they do? Carl, if 
Good trials helped me build more trust in Yeshua. He's brought me this far, and I know he won't leave me. The song says, I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I feel no ways tired. Amen. Amen. The role of the Old Testament prophets, what did they do? They inquired. They investigated. They looked for answers. They wanted to know. They knew it wasn't about them, but they wanted to know what God had revealed, the Holy Spirit, what, the Spirit, what God had revealed to them about the coming of Christ. They searched until they could find answers, and then they preached about it. In Peter 1.13, Peter says, we should get our minds ready for action. What part does our mind have in the life of faith and obedience? What part does our mind have in our life of faith and obedience? Is this a feeling or a decision? Is this a feeling or a decision? Self-control, how we function, determines what our reward will be at the end of the day. Once we make up our mind, once we make a decision, we're not living on a feeling when it comes to accepting Christ. We're not living on a decision. We're not feeling something. We are making a conscious decision about what we're doing. All right? So, between verses 13 and 17, what are connections between hope and holiness? How do we connect the dots between hope and holiness? goes back to that decision, the mindset, focus on obedience, stand straight, following God, being holy for he is go holy, and following the holy one, all right? Since you put your faith in Christ, how have your hopes changed? I can't answer this for you. Since you put your faith in Christ, how has your hope changed? I look forward. I trust God. I know that he is who he say he is. I know that he can do what he say he can do. And I know that I am who he says that I am. And I'm learning more and more that I can do a whole lot through Christ. I knew I could do a lot through Christ, but I'm learning now right, that all things, when he said all, he really meant all. I can do it through him. If it's his will. That's my answer. What's your answer? Anybody? Nobody? All right. Number nine. How can the world still squash us into the shape of the passions we had before we knew Christ? How can the world squash us into the passions that we had before we knew Christ? How can the world do that? Only if we let it. How do we let it? By not having a healthy spiritual diet. Being, as we talked about in the books of John, a satellite Christian. Not loving horizontally, just trying to love vertically. Uh, those things we talked about earlier, slander, deceitfulness, all those things that separate us from the love of God. 
breaking our fellowship, bringing death into us. That's how the world gets a foothold into us. But we give it to them. The world can't do nothing to us unless we allow it. Spirits are not allowed to come into you unless you open the door. Now, suppose you go into a junk shop and find a crack bowl, still dirty with soil and the remains of a few leaves. You spot, as the, obvious, the owner obviously hasn't, that it's a fine piece of porcelain. You buy it, you take it home, you clean it up, you repair the crack. When it's all done, you put it in a place of honor where it holds three gorgeous ornamental eggs and you show them off and to the perfect effect. Now, let's suppose the original owner of that bowl turns up at the junk shop and asks for the bowl back to hold a few fathers. The shop owner directs them to you, but you, Perfectly proper, perfectly properly would say that the bowl is no longer available. Not only have you bought it, you've cleaned it up inside and out and given it a new use for which it is really suited. It would be an insult as well as an injustice to the bowl to use it for, to hold a few flowers. The good news is, we just like that bowl. We have been bought back like a dirty object in the junk shop. We have all been used for all kinds of purposes other than that which we were made. God has come into the junk shop and paid the ultimate price for us, the precious blood of the Messiah, God's own son. Remind yourself of that and don't let any previous owners come up to you and try to force you back to what you once had. Don't let nobody come tell you that this is what you got to do. No. Can't nobody make you do nothing. God has cleaned you up, put you in a position to show off your magnificence. Fix the cracks that we had in us. And we're not just supposed to hold a couple flowers. No, no, no. Gorgeous ornamental eggs. A piece of fine porcelain ought to hold something of value. All right? Carla said, I know my destination now that I have faith in Messiah. Even when I fail at things like dishwashing for the real New Orleans, I know he still has plans for me. I don't focus on the things of this world so that I don't get tempted to be who I used to be. Entertainment and advertisements like to tell us what we need and should do so I limit what I watch. Amen. That's that diet. That's that diet. That's that diet. All right. Most Christians struggle at some point in time with having sincere love for all their fellow believers. What reason does Peter offer for Christians to love one another? What reasons does Peter, Peter offer for Christians to love one another? Peter and John preaching the same thing, y'all. Not the seed of the king, the word of God that lasts forever. That's what's in us. That is the reasons for loving one another. All right? Peter uses another picture, that of the farmer sowing a seed. There is, this is no ordinary seed. It's the living and abiding word of God. Many Christians assume that the word of God simply means the Bible. The phrase is often used in that sense. But when Peter was writing the New Testament, as we know it, it didn't exist. But except for a few bits of pieces circling around, circulating here and there. For him, the Bible would have meant the ancient Israelite scriptures, the Old Testament. But Peter seems to mean more than that. When he speaks of the word that was announced to you, he seems to mean the message about Jesus the Messiah, about God sending him through his sacrificial death and his outpoured spirit. People from every nation might be ransomed 
from their previous life and given a whole new life and purpose in God's service. What does the seed of the word accomplish? What has the seed of the word accomplished in this world and in your own life? I can't answer that for you. You can only answer that for yourself. What has the seed of the word accomplished in the world and in your own life? We see everything that's going on around us. We see how things are changing. We see that the seed is starting to sprout. In some cases, it's starting to sprout. In other places, we see full-grown seeds. Things that are manifesting and doing what they're supposed to do. But your own life, where were you? And where are you? When the seed was planted to where you have grown. Now, as early as the day of Pentecost, the followers of Jesus discovered that when they spoke to people about Jesus, something happened. There's something about that name. <laughs> it wasn't just the people were interested or they decided either to go along with the message or to reject it. It was the word carried energy, a power beyond the mere words. When the word was spoken, something like a blood transfusion took place at some of the for at least some of the believers, for some of the listeners. They found themselves gripped by it, transformed by it, rinsed out by it, given a new sense of presence of God. Hearing the word, they tasted that God is gracious. And they had been born again. Oh, taste and see. Oh, taste and see. Peter reminds us that there is more to salvation than initially being saved. Salvation is something we grow into. Having tasted the word of God is good, we should go on to crave spiritual milk, the real stuff, not watered down. What does it mean to grow in our salvation? What does it mean to grow in our salvation? To learn who we truly are in Christ, what he has done for us, who he is, who we are, what our full potential is. We start as a seed, the size of a mustard, the mustard seed, the smallest seed you can find, but when it's grown to its full potential, it becomes a full grown tree. Amen. You ready, Pastor? I'm too late. Yeah, go for it. Do I have anything there? Uh, no, sir. There's nothing. Okay. All right. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Hold on. Carlos said it's easier to get back to the peace that suppresses all understanding with the Word. The world is insane right now, and it will only get crazier. Knowing and reading the word gives me peace. Amen. Let's go back to Peter 3, 1 Peter 3 and 5. Let's read that, and then we're going to pray. Praise be God, Father of our Lord, Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who in keeping his grace mercy has caused us through the resurrection of Yeshua, the Messiah from the dead, to be born again to a living hope, to an inheritance that cannot decay, spoil, or fade, kept safe for you in heaven. Meanwhile, through trusting, you are being protected by God's power for deliverance, ready to be revealed in the last times. Amen. Let us go to our Father in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, Yeshua, I'm a sinner. We ask you to continue to protect us, to keep us. Watch over us. Keep us born and living and going forward in your hope. Father, you have given us an inheritance that cannot escape, that cannot be spoiled, that will not rot. Father, we just ask you to touch our hearts, souls, and minds, that we may grow 
and learn of you. Father, I ask you to wrap your arms around each and every person that's on the that's paying attention tonight, Father. Touch their hearts, souls, and minds. Father, lift us, keep us. Father, grant us your mercy. You said your grace is sufficient. Your grace is sufficient. Now, Father, I ask you to wrap your arms around our pastor. Bless him and keep him. Protect him, his family, Father. Give him peace, love, understanding. Father, I ask you to bless each and every household with peace, love, and understanding. Your shalom as only you can give it, Father. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Shah Shalom, amen, amen, and amen.